My name is Juan Paulo Verdusco Tovar, and this is my project titled The War on Drugs and its Setback to People of Color and the Psychedelic Community. So in 1971, Richard Nixon declared drugs as public enemy number one and created the Drug Enforcement Agency and the Controlled Substance Act to combat the War on Drugs. The War on Drugs associated drugs with people of color in order to demonize them, along with the drugs which has led to unfair treatment with police and prosecutors making racially skewed charging and plea bargaining decisions which leads to higher incarceration rates. The Controlled Substance Act targeted psychedelics and marijuana, which were more often used by people of color and in the counterculture, which set back years of medical research on marijuana, and especially more so on psychedelics. So, some quick definitions. The DEA, also known as the Drug Enforcement Agency, which combats drug trafficking and distribution within the U.S. You got the CSA, or Controlled Substance Act, uh, which is the scheduling of drugs, and there are five schedules ranked from one being seen as the worst to five being seen as the least dangerous. And these are supposed to be based on their medical value and potential for abuse. And then more specifically, Schedule 1 drugs. Uh, these substances or chemicals are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use, has a high potential for abuse, and a uh, high risk for overdose. Drugs on this list include heroin, LSD, psilocybin, marijuana, and ecstasy. And then psychedelics are hallucinogenic drugs whose primary effect is to trigger non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, the most common one being LSD, uh, psilocybin, or magic mushrooms. And then you got DMT, ayahuasca, and mescaline, which are a little bit less known in the U.S. All right, so breakdown on how this is going to go down. So we're going to go over the war on drugs versus hippie counterculture and how that counterculture used psychedelics as a form of protest uh, to the Vietnam War, uh, the failures of the Controlled Substance Act and the DA, and how their unfair drug scheduling of psychedelics and marijuana halted psychedelic research, uh, demonization and association of minorities with drugs, how the DA and the Controlled Substance Act made unfair drug scheduling that targeted minorities, which caused higher incarceration rates that are still in effect today, and then some recent advancements in better drug scheduling and how we can continue to move forward from here. Alright, so my thesis is the war on drugs was a destructive campaign that harmed minorities by targeting them, associating them with drugs, giving false drug information, holding back years of psychedelic research, and ultimately beginning the uh, streak of skyrocketing rates of incarceration. So, the start of the drug war, the Cold War, and especially the Vietnam War, was a pressing issue that divided the country at the time. Uh, this resulted in many college youth joining the hippie counterculture of the 60s in order to protest the wars and other social issues. Um, a big place where this hippie counterculture gathered um, was Woodstock, where roughly 400,000 hippies and underrepresented minority groups gathered to play music and share their views on war, on the war and social issues while taking psychedelic drugs and other substances. Uh, the use of psychedelic drugs and marijuana played a major role in the counterculture movement, as it was used for self-reflection and rejection of the time modern beliefs such as the draft, the Vietnam War, and etc. And then not only that, you had uh, lots of well-known and respected individuals that also aligned with the counterculture, such as famous writer Aldous Huxley, who wrote uh, Brave New World, also wrote uh, a book titled The Doors of Perception, which is about his psychedelic experiences under the influence of mescaline. Um, this book also ended up inspiring another prominent uh, member of the hippie counterculture, Jim Morrison, who named his band The Doors after reading this book and being inspired by it. And then you have Timothy Leary, who told college students at the time to turn on, tune in, and drop out. And this worried a lot of conservative white suburban families that their kids were going to be dropping out of school to do acid. So that eventually got the attention of President Richard Nixon, who labeled Leary as the most dangerous man, man in America for his advocacy of taking LSD and dropping out of college. And Nixon was not a fan of all these protests and uh, people like Timothy Leary telling college youth to drop out and do acid. So he definitely fought back, um, especially um, with protests. Um, for example, on May 4, 1970, four Kent State University students were killed and nine were injured when the Ohio National Guard opened fire on a group of college students protesting the Vietnam War. Um, this ended up leading to a, college, uh, to a student-led strike that led to the temporary closure of the colleges and universities countrywide, and this also put a negative light on Nixon. And it's kind of sad how we can draw parallels to today with the National Guard attacking peaceful protesters. And then not only that, but Nixon also attacked the counterculture through laws, and he did that by uh, targeting selected drugs like LSD, magic mushrooms, and marijuana, and putting them all in a Schedule One category in the Controlled Substance Act that was released in 1970s, 1970. And these drugs are associated with minorities and hippies in order to give a negative public image of the drugs and of the individuals themselves. And then going over the actual drug scheduling, we're going to see how unfair and unscientific this really is. 
Um, so the hair, so heroin is a Schedule One drug with a high risk for addiction and abuse. High risk for overdose with heroin having 15,961 deaths in 2016. This is one of the few things that I think the DEA is actually doing good as in they're saying that heroin is bad and they're not really giving misinformation to the public. Although I do think that they can be doing more. And then they labeled cocaine as a Schedule Two drug with a high risk for addiction and abuse but slightly less than Schedule One. Um, so essentially the same thing as Schedule One, but they see it as slightly less dangerous. Um, cocaine had 11,316 deaths in 2016 alone. Then you got methamphetamine, which is uh, rampant through our homeless population, also a Schedule II drug, um, with 6,762 deaths in 2016. And you got the biggest killer, fentanyl, which is a Schedule II drug as well, uh, but with an extreme high risk uh, for overdose, as there are 18,335 deaths in 2016. And these numbers have only been going up in recent years. And if you look closely on that little white speck of dust next to that penny, that is more than enough to to kill a man. So what usually ends up happening is that fentanyl is really cheap. So it ends up being mixed with other drugs like cocaine, meth, and even heroin. So unbeknownst to the user, they take a deadly amount and they overdose. And it's pretty sad because three San Diegans die every day due to an opioid uh, overdose. And most of the times it's because it's specifically fentanyl. And then all these drugs right here are the drugs that were put in the Schedule 1 category that were labeled or that were usually um, associated with the hippie counterculture and minorities. Um, and in the eyes of the DEA, all these drugs right here are labeled as having no medical value, having a high risk for addiction, and these drugs can lead to overdoses according to them. But science says otherwise, um, and going down that list, magic mushrooms or psilocybin are a naturally occurring psychedelic that has been used in recent studies um, for treating depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, and even drug addiction. And then you have the synthetic version uh, known as LSD. This one is usually uh, the most common. It's called like sergic acid dithalamide. And it has a stronger effect than, than psilocybin and usually lasts longer uh, between 8 to 10 hours while mushrooms last usually around 6 hours. And then you have marijuana which is a psychoactive drug that can help with uh, pain remedy, anxiety, depression. And it also helps relieve cancer patients as well. And if you see all of these drugs have zero overdoses that are reported directly from actually taking these drugs um, as there's no physical way that uh, psychedelics or even marijuana can cause you to have an overdose. Um, these drugs are not easy to get addicted to and I believe only 1 in 10 people who use marijuana uh, can actually get addicted to it but uh, they, can, they can go through therapy uh, to end their addiction much quicker than other drugs such as meth, uh, heroin, and even alcohol. Um, but all of these drugs here have medical uh, have a medical value that, that has been shown by science. Uh, there's no way to actually get addicted to psychedelics, um, and it's very low. It's a very low chance for you to get addicted to marijuana itself, and there's a zero chance for you to overdose from these drugs. Yet the DEA still schedules these drugs as more dangerous than any other drug uh, listed before. Even though, despite these drugs having over a thousand deaths, they are still seen as more dangerous than them, and that's unfair and unjust. Um, and not only that, the DA also failed to combat LSD specifically, as it was already legal in California in 1966, so enforcing it federally didn't lower production, as most of it was already produced illicitly, and this only held back years of research on psychedelics that could have helped with PTSD, depression, and drug addiction. And then not only that, but the United Nations also revealed that the worldwide opiate consumption increased by 34.5% from 1998 to 2008, and cocaine by 27%, and cannabis by 8%. So the DA has been clearly failing their mission on stopping the use of drugs as it's only been going up over these past few years. And then not only that, it's because uh, there's a bunch of false drug information that's uh, going on. We are in an opioid pandemic because prescription drugs are seen as safer than street drugs. You know, you go to a doctor, they'll write you a prescription to go to a, a pharmacist and they'll give you your drugs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those drugs are safer. And that's what's causing a lot of people to end up becoming addicted to their opioids. And once they can't get their prescriptions filled out, they'll turn to other drugs such as heroin or meth. And this is why I stated before, three San Diegans die every day because of an opioid. And it's really sad how this misinformation is really affecting a lot of people who believe that their drugs that, that are given to them are safe. Only because some drugs are seen as more dangerous than others when that's clearly not the case. Because drugs like marijuana and psychedelics were associated with minorities and drug addicts. 
and failure overall, which gave these drugs and minorities a negative stigma that was based not that was not based on any scientific evidence, while putting prescription drugs on a pedestal on what a good drug should look like. So going on specifically to the demonization of minorities with drugs, since the start of the drug war, people of color have always been the primary target when it comes to arrest and blame for the drug war. People of color were, uh, were often associated with drugs to put them in a bad light, while also criminalizing the same drugs that were more often used by minorities. An example of racial bias in the drug war could be exemplified with a 100 to 1 disparity in prison sentences for powder cocaine versus crack cocaine. Um, in 1994, 90% of those convicted for federal crack cocaine offenses were black, 6% Latino, and less than 4% white. Federal powder cocaine offenders were 30% black, 43% Latino, and 26% white. And then the DEA's annual budget is $2.086 billion, yet they're only able to intercept 6% of the drugs that are distributed into and, uh, into and out of the U.S. $2.086 billion is a, lot of, is a lot of money that's going to waste into this, um, into this as we can be uh, putting this money into better programs such as better drug rehabilitation programs, better research for what drugs are actually safe, and we can actually uh, teach, the, teach the public about drug safety instead of giving misinformation. And then I have a quote from Angela Davis, who saw Tough on Crime initiatives firsthand and how the crackdown of, of drugs uh, with minorities uh, w specifically went down. She said, Tough on Crime initiatives in the 1980s did not produce safer communities or a significant drop in crime rates. It led to a remarkable proliferation of prisons, indeed. Some have dubbed the economic sector that has already risen around prisons a prison industrial complex. And that's kind of what I agree with today. That's how I see prisons. Um, you know, we're just sending a bunch of minorities for for nonviolent drug offenses to these prisons while they're doing hard labor for pennies to a dollar. All right, and then you got poor drug scheduling leading to higher incarceration rates. There's more evidence such as 1993, blacks only made up 30% of drug users while they made up 35% of those arrested for drug possession. One in three black men in their 20s are currently in prison, probation, or parole on any given day. And as of today, nearly 80% of people in federal prison and nearly 60% of people in state prison incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses are either Latino or black. And that's just a sad reality that we're facing today. Um, but fortunately for us, there have been some advancements um, with the decriminalization of marijuana in California, Oregon, and Colorado, along with other states allowing it for medical use. Um, I do believe that is a step in the right direction. Um, hopefully it does become federally legal. And then you got Oregon in 2020, uh, which decriminalized psilocybin and legalized it for medical use. And then just the overall lower negative stigma that's associated with these drugs as they become more mainstream such as marijuana is becoming more more accepted in our society as you see it more so in movies, TV shows, and even celebrities coming out saying that they do it themselves. So with that negative stigma is slowly going away, but it's still there. Um, how can we improve? We can do this by doing scientific-based drug scheduling that does not target minorities, teach the public about the dangers of prescription drugs, free nonviolent drug offenders, decriminalize marijuana and psychedelics for medical research, teach the youth about drug safety without misinformation, help drug abusers rather than criminalize them. And we can do this by viewing drug addiction as a mental health issue and not a criminal issue. Thank you for listening.